So let me uh, welcome all of you at the uh, seminar of the D and Redemocratization uh, Working Group. My name is Joel Tenyadi, and I'm extremely happy to have Erin and Jenny as our speaker uh, today. Um, I uh, used to think of her as an authority in ethnic uh, politics, and um, particularly because of the award-winning uh, uh, Cornell University Press book, um, The Ethnic Bargaining. But actually, her uh, research and teaching portfolio is much more diverse than that. She worked on illiberal politics, um, on uh, nation building, uh, foreign uh, policy, um, populism, obviously. And we are now moving closer to the uh, topic of, of today. Um, and she also teaches methods. Uh, and in a way, I think that today's presentation will be interested, uh, uh, interesting for us also from this methodological point of view, because we will learn about a new database, about a very specific method, and perhaps about the very first findings of uh, this new project as well. So again, great to have uh, you with us. And Erin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joel, for an incredibly generous introduction. I am very excited to be here to present the, as you say, preliminary findings of our work. And uh, so this is basically a database that has been long in the making, and it has been supported generously by the Intellect Intellectual Themes Initiative at CEU, which generously provided more than $100,000 for this project, which actually took us a fair distance in developing the database. The funds were also used for other um, projects within the wider project, um, but this was sort of the crown jewel, so to speak. So what, what generated this? What, what were the questions that were driving this research? So first of all, as we all know, populism is sort of the name of the game when we think about illiberalism and you know the emergence of these kind of authoritarian leaders like um, Bolsonaro and Trump and uh, Narendra Modi, um, uh, Gorevsky in North Macedonia. So there's a range of leaders that seem to talk in a way that is not so familiar right, to those of us who are kind of used to a, a sort of standard way that, you know, leaders kind of talk to their constituents. So we were asking what, whether or not populism is sort of explaining all of this, is sort of capturing all of this movement, and whether nationalism is also present in the type of rhetoric these leaders use in their speeches to their constituents. So we kind of were interested in the intersection between the two of them, populism and nationalism, um, and the focus is on Europe. And as a sub question, we were also interested in whether there were um, distinctive sub regional patterns. So first of all, has there been an increase in both populism, nationalism, or one or the other? over time. So that was one of the things that we were looking at, whether there was a secular increase over time. And then secondly, whether there are sub-regional patterns in the intersection between nationalism and populism in leader speeches. And then the third kind of discourse that we were interested in was social conservatism. And this roughly maps on to the populist radical right or PRR that is famously attributed to Cass Muta. Right. So this is kind of the, the populist radical right or authoritarian populism that that mixes all of these elements of, you know, the people versus elite type of rhetoric, the national self versus the national others. Um, and then this social conservatism as opposed to progressivism in speech. So these are kind of the big picture questions that we were trying to address in the uh, research. So this led to the Comparative Populism Project, which, as I said, was generously funded by CEU. It involves more than a dozen CEU and non-CEU researchers. A few of them are here today, and uh, pretty much all of them, I think, are associated with Team Populism, which is a, an inter-university 
interdisciplinary team or network of researchers who are working in one way or another on populism. Um, and the people who are involved include um, Rosario Aguilar, Levente Lipe, who's here, um, Kirk Hawkins, um, who I'll talk about in a second, Bruno Castanjo Silva, who is one of our uh, recent um, graduates, PhD graduates, who's doing very, very well. He's at the University of Cologne. Um, Ravi Shata, who has also been publishing in Populism, and he took the reins of you know all the contracting and you know making sure the coders were paid. Um, Jolt Enyadi, who helped with uh, the rubrics uh, because nationalism and social conservatism were uh, created, developed by me, but also in a consultation with people like Jolt and Nick Sitter. Uh, I think they made a, a really big impact on the, the ultimate rubric. And I also want to give a shout out to Dominic Brenner, who did the, some of the uh, step graphs that I'll be showing you on different countries. So looking at the three discourses, the relative level of nationalism, populism, and social conservatism in these speeches and how they've changed over time. Okay, so, um, so just a little bit about the data set itself. It's extending Kirk Hawkins' global populism data set which was developed and run actually here at CEU in 2013. He created this, um, you know, developed the uh, method that's used for the grading of speeches. It's based on something he calls holistic grading, where, which comes from educational psychology. And essentially what it consists of is developing a rubric that represents the basic framework or ideological components of the different discourses. And uh, we then use the rubrics as well as a series of uh, recorded lectures to train up coders in how to recognize the relative presence of each of these discourses in a given speech. And then there are also rules about how to select the speeches themselves, which I'm happy to go into in the Q&A if people are interested. So essentially, this is what I wanted to emphasize is that originally the data set was a populism data set. And in this larger data set, uh, or maybe more complicated data set, we're also measuring the levels of nationalism and social conservatism in the same speeches. And what we're doing is mapping political rhetoric over the past 18 to 25 years on these three discourses. So the unit of analysis is, since we're looking at leader speeches, one presidential or prime minister term. And each term is coded as an average of the scores given to uh, four speeches for each uh, government term, right? And the speeches, speech types are a campaign speech, an international speech, ribbon cutting speech, and a famous speech, right? So each point essentially represents an average of the scores given to each, uh, like a speech from each of those categories for each governmental term, if that makes sense. I'm happy to clarify if there, if there are any, any confusion about that. So what does it look like overall? We have uh, 31 countries represented. These are in Europe, so Western and Eastern Europe, uh, Southeast Europe, and also North America, US, and Canada. 137 government terms. We used and trained up 70 expert coders. These are students, uh, mostly MA students, but a few PhD students. And what they were doing, they were selected for their uh, expertise in the country that they're coding. So essentially they went out, gathered the speeches for each government term, and then each coder separately coded the speeches up. Then there was a reconciliation meeting where we discussed uh, you know, how each of the coders had arrived at their scores in case that there was any sort of confusion or discrepancies, we would adjust the scores at that point. So um, what are the rogue rubrics themselves? So the first one is the populism rubric, and this is developed, as I said, by Kirk Hawkins, and the coding ranges from zero to, to two, um, zero being basically no populism and two being the absolute, um, the most. And 
and there were anchor speeches, what's called anchor speeches. So, so speeches with the with kind of the most and the least that they could use to compare each speech. So it sort of defined the range of populist uh, um, uh, scores for them. And essentially, again, this follows Casmuda's definition of populism, which is Populism is uh, composed of three components of people centrism and anti elitism and uh, the sense that there is a Manichaean struggle between the people and the elite of cosmic proportions. And so how it goes is that there has to be an element of each of them in order to be counted as populist. Right. Because we didn't we wanted to exclude those. Uh, the type of speech that talks about the people, but doesn't really talk about elite. So it doesn't, it's not really so popular so much as just a political speech. And then secondly, uh, the nationalism rubric also ranges from zero to two. And I developed it based on Michael Billick's uh, social identity theory approach. And here the, the speeches are separated out for a kind of inclusionary nationalism versus an exclusionary nationalism, an inclusionary nationalism that focuses on the national self that says, you know, we have to elevate the self. And, you know, we've struggled so much in the past, you know, all of these traumas have brought us together and we have to lift ourselves up and go to the future. So that would be an, a kind of self-oriented nationalism versus an other a defense against other that would be focused on national others, enemy nations, um, possibly um, migrants that are from a national uh, minority, that all of them pose some kind of threat to the, the in-group, the ethnonational in-group. So this is the nationalism rubric. Then the social conservatism rubric, which, um, you know, basically we, we published a paper based on the 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 results of the populism and nationalism. We haven't yet done anything with the social conservatism data. So this is what I, I would love to talk about um, today as well. This rubric is also um, developed by me based on George Lakoff's cognitive linguistic work. So he's a cognitive psychologist um, and he he has this theory about moral reasoning that he says that you know there's there's these kind of dual ways of thinking about politics. There's one that's based on a nurturing parent, a kind of a social progressivist. We have to help each other. We have to give rights to everyone. Um, you know, you, we have to rely on and form a kind of solidaristic social fabric. And then the other is a kind of strict father notion about politics, which emphasizes law and order, um, tradition, um, uh, hierarchical relations potentially, and uh, and there often also is a lot of what I call God talk. So references to sort of you know God and the legacy and sort of tradition and the way that things have always done should be how we do things in the future. So um, going forward, I, I have a few quotes that I hope will illustrate the differences between these discourses. And these come out of either anchor speeches that we're using to code the speeches, uh, or they come out of actually the speech data themselves. And so the first is from Armenian president, Serge Sargsyan. And he says, so this is basically in the context of, uh, you know, his issues with Nagorno-Karabakh. Right. So he talks a lot about kind of territorial integrity and the Armenian nation. He says that the government should serve as a main guarantor of the territorial integrity and security of Armenia to create the Armenia of our dreams. The problem was that Armenia was trying to normalize relations with a country that had carried out policies of deportation and extermination of our people during the Ottoman Empire. So obviously referring to Turkey. So here you have both the national self and the national others, right? We are creating the Armenia of our dreams, but this is also being somewhat thwarted by our historic national enemy, which are the Ottoman Turks, right? So then this also, uh, echo, this also kind of um, um, draws our attention to the Armenian genocide and you know, the historic injustices that have been wrought against the Armenian people. 
So another example, and this might be a little bit surprising because it's Canada. You know, don't think of a lot of nationalism when you think of Canada, right? They're the sort of the peace, the peace people, the peacekeeping people who do peace support missions and so on. Um, but actually, there was a lot of nationalism in the speeches of Stephen Harper. So in 2012, on the site of um, basically an Arctic expeditionary platform, he said, our sovereignty, our presence, and our ability to project our presence everywhere we place our flag, that is where you come in. You are a part of a determined expansion that we have made our sovereign presence in the Arctic, and we also remain determined to assert our national interests. So um, there's a little bit more of this national self and the assertion of national sovereignty than a sort of hostile national other, but it, it was very strong. Okay, so moving to populism. <clears throat> So here we were, the focus is not so much on territory and borders and the national self versus the national other, as much as the sort of elite people uh, distinction, this dichotomization of society into these two discrete homogenous groups that are, um, have a oppositional relationship with each other to the extent the elites are, uh, are exploiting and frustrating the will of the people. <clears throat> so the first example here comes from Slovakia's, Slovakia's prime minister, first prime minister uh, Vladimir Mečiar in 1994. And you know, he's, he's actually um, taking issue with the previous leadership of Czarnogórski. He says that the right leadership for those who have been failing for years for the sake of people who have been failing for years in programs and have built up the whole program only on hatred, disowning people, lying, provoking affairs, afraid, many unsubstantiated raids, waiting for foreign uh, um, representatives or foreign media or foreign businesses to come to Slovakia to win the election for them. So here there's not a lot of talk of the Slovak nation, rather the focus is on this previous elite that is, is again frustrating the will of the Slovak people. So there, it's very much a kind of like a political, a governmental type of focus. And then I also uh, think that populism is quite strong in the speeches of Bernie Sanders, so uh, more of a, a very clearly left wing. Um, focus on sort of corporate elites rather than political elites. He says this campaign is, and this is the 20, for the 2016 presidential elections, this campaign is about transforming America. It is about ending a campaign finance system which is corrupt and allows billionaires to buy elections. It is about creating an economy that works for all of us, not just the 1%. It is about ending the disgrace that millions of undocumented people live, continue to live in fear and are exploited every day on the jobs because they have no legal rights. So this is a classic kind of left-wing populism. Again, no real focus on the nation, rather it's these elites that are exploiting the poor hapless people. And, it, and this takes a kind of an economic um, dimension. Now, what does social conservatism look like? The referent object here is not the people as it is for populism, it's not the nation as it is for nationalism, but it's the society. Right. And so it, it 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 posits a particular view about how society should be structured. So here are a few examples that we have. This is from the one of the anchor speeches, a U.S. president, presidential candidate Ted Cruz, who will surely be running again in 2024. So keep an eye on him. So he gave a speech at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. <clears throat> And for those of you who don't know, this is a Christian university, and it used to be the standard place that all presidential candidates in the U.S. would go to on the campaign trail. He says, from the dawn of this country, every stage of America, America has enjoyed God's providential blessing. Over and over, when we faced impossible odds, the American people rose to the challenge. You know, comparing to that, repealing Obamacare and abolishing the IRS ain't all that tough. <clears throat> So you hear, you hear God, you know, you also hear some combination with sort of nationalism here. Um, and this notion that, you know, we, we really need to follow God's plan, right? God has a plan for the nation and this, and this is um, the best way to lead um, America is by following this plan. 
Another example is given by Yaroslav Kuczynski in Staro, Starochowice in 2021. And this is on the anniversary of his mother's memorial. <clears throat> and it's in, in connection to the, um, the more stringent abortion, anti-abortion law that was passed. So he says, evil is attacking our country, our fatherland, our nation. It is attacking the institution that is at the heart of our identity, the Catholic Church. And so he goes on also where he invokes kind of these evil others who are cooperating with these internal kind of fifth column. He even uses this terminology. So you hear a lot of this also populism and nationalism there. So this looks close to what Casimir speaks of when he talks about PRR, populist radical right. <clears throat> Another example is given by Belarusian President Viktor Lukashenko at a ribbon cutting ceremony for police in 2017. It was the hundredth anniversary of their formation. He says the Belarusian nation needs needed protection, a strong shoulder, and you managed to restore people's confidence in the future, ensure the public order, and rebuild the authority of the state. So there's this again focus on you know, um, controlling society on law and order, on following tradition, <clears throat> and that this is an important feature of how society ought to be ordered. Okay. Now, so this, uh, these are um, all of the leader terms. So basically the countries, the number of leader terms or government terms, uh, also we call them this, uh, that are coded for, and this is also the period of analysis you can kind of see. And these are the 10 most populous leaders. Now this comes out of an article that Bruno Kirk and I published in um, Studies for Comparative International Development last year in 2021. I linked to the full text in the, or the publisher provided the full text on my personal website. So if you're interested, you can just easily find it there. Um, so you can kind of see with the populist leaders, the most populist leaders in the data set, one thing that connects them all is that they're all basically from Eastern Europe or East Central Europe, right? There are no Western leaders that fall among the most, the top 10 most populist leaders. And I, I think that that's important and it tells us something about, um, you know, when we're likely to see more populist rhetoric in the leader's speeches and communication with the public and when not. So then we see oops, the top 10 most nationalist leaders, and this is divided into national self and national others, and then they're sort of added up to a final score. Um, and you can see here that there are a few of the same people. So Lukashenko uh, shows up in both. Um, Erdogan shows up in both for the presidential term. Um, that was the most recent term in our data set. And then, um, and then Orban also. But then we also see maybe some surprising and not so surprising. So Tujman, we all kind of think of him as quite nationalist. So it's not that surprising that he shows up here. Um, uh, but yeah, Saakashvili, and Poroshenko, um, and also David Cameron and Stephen Harper, right? So you see a few Western leaders in here as well. Okay, this is the correlation between the scores. Again, these are the average for the four speeches for each government term, right? And each of them are plotted on national self dimension on the x-axis and national other on the y-axis. And you can see that self and other, unsurprisingly, are highly correlated. So this is consistent with what we would expect from social identity theory, that self is always defined against the other, right? So it makes much more sense to be using this type of rhetoric if you're naming not just the national self, but also the threats to the self, the other. And then we also see that there is a strong relationship between populism and nationalism, but it's not perfect, right? So this suggests that there, there is a relationship between these two discourses, but it's not a one-to-one -one thing. Um, and there are important differences that I think we ought to pay attention to. So this is also in the paper. So all of these things are in the paper that I referenced. 
an overtime yearly average and confidence intervals for both the aggregate uh, level of populism and nationalism. So basically um, averaging together the level of all of the leaders for each, um, each basically each year. And we can see that more or less, there's not a whole lot of increase in either of them, although it does look to be the case that you know the last decade the aughts were more of or leaders were a bit stronger on populism, which isn't that surprising if you think about you know Southeast Europe and a lot of the kind of um, populist rhetoric against you know international banks and globalist financial institutions in the wake of the financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis also. And then we also see a, a ticking up in of nationalism, which I think is also unsurprising in the European context, given uh, the successive migration crises, um, particularly the uh, the Syrian and Afghan and Libyan migration that started in 2015. I mean, it's not a big uh, it's not a big effect. It's not a big difference, but I, I think this is something that we've definitely noticed in the speeches. Now these, there's better graphs in the paper uh, here, but what I wanted to draw your attention to is that we do in fact see some important sub-regional variation. So, um, so we do see, for example, again, it looks better with the, when, you, when you actually, you can sort of see this better if you look at the graphs in the paper, but we don't see a lot of uptick of either nationalism or populism in the speeches of leaders of West European countries or North American countries until Trump. Um, and then the UK kind of, you know, after Brexit, you start seeing some increase there in nationalism. Um, but you do see an increase in Central and Eastern Europe, um, also, also a bit in Southeast Europe, and interestingly, a decrease in the post-Soviet uh, states, which I think is a feature of the fact that growing authoritarianism in that part of the world makes this type of um, politicking using these speeches less useful, less important. They're getting their legitimation through other types of strategies like performance legitimacy and so on. And, and in fact, that's an interesting thing that we, that, that we notice from the data is, you know, if you look, for example, at Putin's speeches, and again, we don't have the most recent ones, but most of them are essentially him talking about all the successes that they've had in, you know, education and healthcare and, you know, pensions. And so his Putin speeches are kind of unremarkable from the point of view of nationalism, and populism, and even social conservatism, which I think is interesting, but not that surprising, given these are authoritarian, like properly authoritarian country. This is a graph that I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with. You've seen this before. You can generate this quickly on the VDEM uh, um, site. And this is essentially what this is, is a plotting of um, countries. This is um, on, I think that's, yeah, liberal the liberal democracy index. So basically each country is plotted for its you know, 2000 score on liberal on democracy against its 2018 score. So we see that they're, you know, against this narrative that you've, you're seeing a backsliding of, of democracy everywhere. In fact, it's localized. So we see that these are the red, the red dots are basically anything that falling below the diagonal are basically countries where there's been backsliding on liberal democracy and anything above the diagonal are countries where there's actually been improvements in democratization. So this should remind us that in fact, there is still progress towards democratization in many countries in the world, but we focus here on the backsliders. So in a lot of them, um, a number of them are in Eastern Europe, but not only. <clears throat> So what do we see in our data? So this is an, the second question that we were asking about, or maybe it's the third one. Um, are there, can you see any effects of um, populist and nationalist rhetoric on, um, you know, different indicators of democratic decline? 
right? So essentially what each of these graphs are, if you look at them, this is populism. And on, on the x-axis and the y-axis, essentially you have a change from uh, the end of the leader term uh, from the beginning to the end of the leader term, that difference was regressed on populism. And this is basically a change in clean elections. Um, and then in the upper right, change in media freedoms and the lower left, um, change in judiciary oversight of the executive, and then finally change in electoral turnout. And you see that there is actually a negative, not significant relationship, but negative relationship um, in the first three and a positive in the final one, which may suggest it's just barely significant It may suggest that um, populist leaders do, in fact, increase uh, the level of turnout, right, which is, is not that unsurprising, right, because they're appealing to the, the public using this kind of um, firebrand people versus elite rhetoric that might expect you, you we might expect therefore to see more um, turnout okay and then here we see um also for you know comparing populism and nationalism and then we do see using uh world bank data on corruption during the term that there is a slight uptick overall average uptick in the level of corruption both um, both for nationalist and also um, populist scores. And then we can, uh, and then we can also see, and this is where social conservatism finally comes in. Um, you know, this is again that we have not gone through this data as thoroughly, but there is some interesting descriptives that you can kind of see. And one that I think that is very interesting is that you have a negative relationship between nationalism and social conservatism in Western Europe and no relationship in Southeast Europe, but actually a positive relationship in all of the three other regions with Turkey and North America separate, not obviously a lot of data for those, but you can see in post-Soviet states and Central and Eastern Europe, so basically post-communist countries, that there does seem to be a relationship between nationalism and social conservatism. And um, similarly, you see this relationship between populism and social conservatism, where um, you see a fair, fairly strong relationship between them in post-Soviet states, a little bit weaker relationship between them in Central and Eastern Europe, and then an, you know, Turkey, and then none in Western Europe and Southeast Europe. So the, what this suggests, we think, is that social conservatism is, uh, it, it really matters how it's articulated, right? That, it, that social conservatism is not necessarily um, populist, it's not necessarily nationalist, but, um, but it very often is the case in these particular regions and less so in Western Europe. Okay, so this is just looking at the country level. Um, this is, I just wanted to zoom in on the cases of Hungary and Turkey since elections are coming up. I'm a new um, Magyar Alam Polgar and I'm very excited to be voting um, on April 3rd. Um, so, this is what it looks like if you look at the three social conservatism, nationalism, and populism in the case of Hungary. So we can see very low levels of three for the, the Horn um, uh, leader term. And then we see an uptick in all three of them for Orban one. And then again, as we would expect, back down again for Durchan. And then really we see um, uh, populism, even more so than nationalism, but also nationalism increased significantly since 2010 for Orban. So this should remind us that it's not the leaders that are necessarily populist and nationalist. They vary their populist and nationalist rhetoric over time. Um, some people argue for uh, instrumental reasons. Others argue that there's there have been some ideological changes what this shows us is that there has been a change over time. Um, also, this was uh, the 2018 elections were coded up. So basically the, the main contenders for the election, they were coded up using a key speech from the first and second rounds of the elections in 2018. Um, so we basically we have uh, uh, 
uh, Fides, Orban, um, MSP, Karachan, uh, Deka, Durchan, um, uh, Jobik, Vona, and the LMP, Bernadette Sale. And so these are, I think, interesting, right? Because we do see that there is a variation. You see Orban, who's high in all three, like by far and away, kind of capturing that very high and social conservatism, um, populism, and nationalism. And we see com comparably uh, Vona is also high on nationalism, although not as high, but a lot lower on populism. And we know that this is in response to their kind of movement to the middle in response to Fides kind of uh, taking over, colonizing the, the, the you know, co-opting the mission, the message on the right. And then all the other three are kind of generally pretty low. Jurchon, Karachon, and Seo. Um, and then here is, um, this is just nationalism and populism in Turkey. Um, and it's also mapped together with a liberal uh, democracy index. So we can see that, you know, you have, you have obviously an overtime erosion in liberal democracy and you have an overtime increase in the levels of nationalism and populism correlation is not causation, but this is an interesting pattern that bears investigating. <clears throat> this is a this is actually a map of all of the leader terms, all 137 of them on a, a two-dimensional space, nationalism and populism. Um, working on a cube now for social conservatism, but it's not really that legible. You can't really interpret it very well. So it's um, it's in the making. Hopefully it will be something rather than nothing. But I think what's interesting is that you can see even the same leaders that move from the zero, zero, you know, uh, origin point um, all the way um, to the far upper right side. In Erdogan's case, it's, it's quite dramatic. And Lukashenko moves around quite a bit, too. And uh, Gurevsky moves around. We actually we see the Austrians move quite a bit on nationalism and not much on populism over a period of analysis and the same with the French data. So there again, a lot of movement on nationalism, not so much on populism and Canada too. So these are interesting non-populist but nationalist uh, leaders or at least country cases. So conclusions, um, and I have some more, I have some more country plots if you're interested in looking at those too. So you can just ask and we can go through some of them. Um, so first of all, leader uh, level populist and nationalist rhetoric is a very weak leading indicator of democratic decline. Um, secondly, when nationalism and populism combine into ethnopopulism, which I've written extensively about, but haven't really talked about here, you see this kind of merging of, um, you know, this kind of elite signifier with a national other signifier. So very famously, Orban um, has made claims about um, Shor the Shorosh plan, the Shorosh Ter, um, that's, uh, that is uh, resettling 40 million uh, migrants. This is after the, the first migrant crisis in Hungary and the aim is to deracinate um, you know the people. This this very much picks up on anti-Semitic populist tropes of you know these elites, very often kind of Jewish, you know, so you have a lot of this anti-Semitic code kind of mixed in that are um, that are using these national others in order to weaken the the, the nation people. So, the, so this is something that you that you see in also very famous um, fascist leaders as well. It's, it's very, very strong in that rhetoric. Um, and you can see it very much. It's very, very apparent in um, in Kaczynski's uh, in how he talks in his speeches, as well as Orban and um, to a, a lesser extent Erdogan. There's not so much of this the same kind of um you know, pol politicking against these national others as there is in the cases of um, uh, Kaczynski and Orban. And then the social conservatism appears to combine with nationalism and populism to create a populist radical right in post-communist Europe. So you see this kind of rhetoric in post-communist European cases, particularly um, in East Central Europe, 
the way I think about it is these are countries on the periphery and there are, you know, there's a lot of politicking around sovereign concerns. And this is where all of these discourses kind of meet. Social conservatism is not, on the other hand, consistently associated with nationalism or populism in West Europe or North America. And so, and I think this is a, a part of how to think about this is that this is a kind of a core periphery story less populism in the core, more on the periphery. Although, of course, that has changed to some extent in um, cases of the UK and the US. Okay, so that's it. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, sorry about that. Oh, um, here are a list of publications. Um, you can see the one that's highlighted in purple is it basically contains the first results of this data set focusing on populism and nationalism. There's been no publications on the social conservatism yet, um, but you can also see other um, other publications, both co-authored and not, by me on on these same and similar topics. Thank you.